Hello guys, my name is Danny Mac, and in this tutorial I'm going to outline my 3D character creation pipeline from concept to final image. Before I get into it, I just want to point out that this workflow is never linear. And what you'll find is that you'll end up jumping backwards and forwards as well as working on different aspects concurrently. But this will show generally the order in which you ought to proceed when creating 3D characters. Now I'm going to keep the description of each section quite basic because I know that a lot of people that ask after my tutorials have never really dipped their toes into 3D. So I think this introduction to 3D workflow will be quite useful. What I will say is that for those that follow me on Gumroad or Patreon, this workflow will highlight all of the topics that I intend to cover in upcoming tutorials. So make sure you find me via the links on the screen or in the description below if you want to get involved. And I'll make sure to highlight the software which I use in each section which I'll use in the tutorials. The concept. So in a studio environment, the 3D artist will usually work from a concept. So you want your portfolio to show that you're capable of translating a 2D concept into a 3D character. Uh, you know, one of the most important things, or I guess insightful things to have in your portfolio is something that showcases a transition from a 2D design to a 3D model. Now, I know in the example on the screen I'm working from a photograph, which is a lack of foresight by me, uh, but I would recommend working from a character designer's concept. And the reason for this is because if your design skills aren't as good as a dedicated character designer, which is quite often the case, then you're effectively limiting how good your final 3D result can be. So I recommend finding a great design in a similar style to what you're hoping to achieve and then go and ask the artist if you can work from it. You'll find that, generally speaking, that artists love the idea of their work being translated into 3D, just don't use it for commercial purposes, unless otherwise agreed. Modeling and sculpting. Modeling and sculpting are similar and interchangeable practices, but it's useful to understand how to differentiate between the two. So what used to happen before digital sculpting became the norm is that everything was modelled in an all-round modelling app such as Maya or Blender. This type of modelling is when you create a 3D object by selecting and moving vertices, edges and faces, sometimes referred to as poly modelling or box modelling. For hard surface models this is fine because it lends itself to a more precise workflow and, as such, it's still the preferred approach to hard surface modelling today. However, modelling this way becomes incredibly tedious for organic modelling and doesn't really offer a practical way to add fine details to a model, which is where sculpting comes in. Now, sculpting is, in essence, modelling. The end goal is essentially the same, but there's some important differences. Sculpting uses a brush-based system, so rather than selecting and moving individual vertices, you use a brush to manipulate many vertices at the same time. Now by its very nature, this is a more artist-friendly and intuitive approach to organic modelling. And another important difference is that with modelling, you work with a relatively low number of polygons, whereas in sculpting, this number can get very high before later being reduced by a process known as retopology, which I'll talk about in a moment. In the early days of sculpting, and is still a common practice today, what you would do is create your base mesh in your modelling app, and then bring it over to a sculpting app such as ZBrush or Mudbox to add details over the top. A newer approach, and the approach I take, is to start working directly in ZBrush from scratch. So just to recap, modelling is very good at hard surface, but not the best suited to organic. And sculpting is very good at organic, but traditionally not best suited to hard surface. That being said, ZBrush has made some serious advancements in recent years for hard surface modelling, making it more than a viable choice. My sculpting tool of choice is ZBrush. <laughs> 
and my modelling tool of choice is interchangeable between Maya and ZBrush. Retopology. As I mentioned earlier, sculpting involves working with a very high number of polygons, and the problem with this is, is that it's very taxing on system resources. So what we need to do is to dramatically reduce the number of polygons used to describe the mesh through a process known as retopology. At first, this process might seem to eliminate all the sculpted details. However, once we get into the baking section of this tutorial, we'll bring those details back. And for that, we're going to need to keep hold of the high poly mesh as well. Now, as well as reducing the number of polygons, with retopology you also need to consider how best to arrange the polygons for clean deformations when we start animating. Done correctly, retopology will improve rigging, UV layout, map baking and the performance of your computer. Retopology also improves sculpting workflow, so I will always retopologize my characters quite early in the sculpting process. My retopology tool of choice is 3D Coat, though I do find myself using Maya more as their retopology tools mature, simply out of convenience. UV Mapping UV mapping is a process of mapping out the 3D coordinates of your mesh onto a 2D surface. If you've ever created the blueprint of a box when you were younger, and then cut it out and folded it together, Laying out UVs is the exact opposite to this. So what you do is create the 3D object and then create the 2D blueprint from that. Once your 3D model is mapped onto a 2D plane, you can then apply 2D textures to your model. My personal UV mapping tool of choice is Unfold 3D in Maya along with Maya's native UV tools. Surfacing. Once your model has UVs, you can then move on to surfacing, which essentially involves describing the surface qualities of the material on the character. I will split this section up into two subcategories, baking and texturing. I would also consider shading to be part of this category, but I will discuss that later when I talk about rendering. Baking. Baking is primarily the process of taking the high resolution sculpt and the lower resolution retopologized mesh and calculating the differences between them. Once the computer has done this, it will then create one or more 2D maps which when applied to the lower resolution mesh will bring back all the high resolution details. This is normally in the form of displacement maps, normal maps and or bump maps. Baking is also capable of producing maps that specifically help with procedural texturing, which is fundamental to working in Substance Painter. My baking tool of choice is interchangeable between ZBrush and Substance Painter. Texturing Texturing is when you get to have some fun, because you start adding materials to your character. You then manipulate these materials to start describing things like the colour, is it shiny or rough? Is it dirty or wet? Is it skin or cloth or leather? That sort of thing. This is usually done using a combination of procedural and painted textures. My personal texturing tool of choice is Substance Painter and Photoshop. Rigging. Rigging is essentially turning your static character into a digital puppet. It usually involves creating a skeleton that sits inside the character to which the character mesh is bound. Once the mesh is bound to the skeleton, it then needs to be weighted, which is essentially the process of making sure the mesh behaves as it should when the skeleton is moved around. So in other words, behaves as it should when it's animated, or in my case, paused. A professional rigger will also create lots of controls for the animator to easily manipulate the skeleton how they require. In my case however, I don't really need this level of control so I only tend to make the most basic rig. I should also say at this point that I don't always rig my characters, but instead pose them directly in ZBrush 
This is only if I intend to create one pause. If I need to make several pauses, it would be worth the extra time to set up a rig since a rig can be reused. My personal rigging tool of choice is Maya. Groom. There's two types of hair used for 3D. There's poly hair or realistic style hair. I do both and you can see a free tutorial on how I create poly hair using the link below. However in this tutorial I'm talking about realistic hair which is so complex it gets a category all of its own. You need to become part 3D technician, part hair stylist to produce a good result. Rather than trying to control each individual strand, which would obviously be far too laborious and time consuming, the hair is controlled by a series of guides and or curves. So the first step is to get your guides down, which can be done in a few different ways. You could either place and shape them all manually, you could import curves from another app such as ZBrush, or you could convert polyhair into curves or use polyhair as a template on which to draw your own curves. You also need to take care of things like density, tapering, clumping, masking, variation, etc, etc. Grooming also involves its own special kind of shading, so you can see it's quite a big topic to digest. My personal tool of choice for grooming is XGen in Maya. Animating stroke pausing. So personally, I don't usually animate my characters, but I just wanted to add it in here so beginners would know where it fits in the pipeline. What I do, however, and as will you if your end goal is a portfolio piece, is simply pause the character since the end result is just a still image. As I've already mentioned, sometimes you'll do this in ZBrush, sometimes you'll do this in Maya. In fact, quite often I'll actually use a little bit of both. Do you remember that I said once the character is bound to the skeleton it needs to be weighted? Well doing this properly is one of the reasons why rigging takes so long. So what I like to do instead is give it dirty weights. And what I mean by this is that I'll just spend just enough time weighting it that the inevitable bad deformations don't take too long to clean up in ZBrush. Therefore, my personal posing tool of choice is ZBrush and or Maya. Rendering. Rendering is when things start to look really awesome. Closely linked with rendering is lighting and as I mentioned earlier, shading. So again, I'm going to split this section up. Lighting. Lighting, as I say, is closely tied with rendering, but it's also considered an art in its own right. Lighting in 3D is somewhat the same as you would expect in the real world, in say, a photo shoot. So for example, you might use a key, a fill and a rim light in order to shape your subject and direct the composition and mood of the shot. However, in the real world, natural light is often taken for granted. You can't take natural light for granted in 3D but tools such as global illumination and image-based lighting really help to speed up achieving believable results. Shading. Shading is when you start to see the final look of your materials. It's when you take all your 2D maps from baking and texturing and plug them into your model essentially, be it a game engine or a production renderer. However, shading doesn't necessarily rely on 2D maps and can be done procedurally within your rendering app. This allows for a lot of control over the final look. Okay, so rendering takes everything that we've discussed so far, the modeling, the grooming, the texturing, the animating, the lighting, the shading, it takes all of that and calculates the color of each individual pixel on the screen. And it's worth noting that an important aspect of offline rendering is passes which allows you to render many different elements separately so that they can still be tweaked individually beyond the rendering process, which I'll talk about in the next section. My personal tool of choice is Renderman for Maya. Compositing. So the last step is compositing, which consists of pulling all those passes into a compositing app and arranging them into a final image. Passes can refer to 
different objects such as a character or a car or a building etc. Or passes can refer to several layers of the same object such as colour, specular, subsurface scattering, depth mapping etc. Compositing might also mean bringing in something that you haven't rendered such as a matte painting. And this process generally involves a lot of colour grading in order to unify all the separate elements into the final piece. And my personal tool of choice for compositing is Photoshop. Ok guys, I hope you found this tutorial useful. I will be creating a new tutorial each month for Gumroad and Patreon that will focus on one or more categories outlined in this tutorial. Now what I will say is that I will focus more energy on the tutorials that I personally feel I'm stronger at. So for example, expect more sculpting tutorials than rigging tutorials. But the idea is to gradually build up a full course on creating 3D characters. And by segmenting the course in this way, it means you can cherry pick which tutorials you need and not bother with those that you don't. So again, if you want to get involved, come follow me on Gumroad or subscribe to me on Patreon and I will see you next month. Peace.